Hello Christ Church, we're back with you again for the continuation of our uh, Lenten series and we are so thankful that you are tuning in wherever you are and whatever you're doing. We're glad that you've taken some time out to, um, to view this video um, to continue our Lenten series. It is a, a great pleasure of mine to have Simone Salas with us here at Christ Church and, and um, we're thankful that he came and was able to um, make a video um, in light of not being able to be with you in person. Um, I've gotten to know Simone over the last year and a half that I've been here in San Antonio, and he's the executive director of Good Samaritan Center and the Good Samaritan Ministries. And um, what an incredible gift he is to our community, and I think you're really going to enjoy what he has to say for us today. Um, at the end of his presentation, I'm going to come back up here and lead us in a few questions for us to think about and talk over with family members and friends and anyone that we can reach out to um, as a way for Simone's talk to continue to be a part of our conversation um, and in, in the many different ways that we're having conversations today. Before we bring Simone up, I would love for us to pray. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we give you thanks and praise for this day. And we know, Lord God, that um, it is a, um, a very uh, stressful time, a time of unknowns and a time of rapid changes. And Lord God, there are so many people who are in need and, and um, we're thankful for Good Samaritan Centers and for their ministry and for Simone's leadership, for all that they do in the communities throughout our diocese. And Lord God, we pray that in this time of of changes and time of dislocation, time of, of um, extreme need for healing, that, um, that we pray that Good Sam would be, continue to be a beacon of hope and a beacon of light and healing in our communities. And Lord God, we pray that you would be with Simone, calm his heart and mind, and allow you to speak through him that the words that he would say today would um, transform us and build us up in ways that we never thought of before and that we would come together to serve our community. Lord God, I pray a special blessing upon everyone who is watching um, this video at this time, that your healing hand would be upon all of us, and your hand of protection would be upon us, and that you would fill us with grace and love um, and your peace. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Amen. And now I bring up to, to the podium uh, Simone Salas. Simone, glad you're here. I'm very happy to be here. <clears throat> Good evening, members of Christ Church, Father Gahan, Father Lindstrom, and friends. I wish we could be together in union to break bread and share space and conversation, and I do hope to be with you in the near future so that we can commune. I've been leading Good Samaritan for the past three years, and I've had a connection to Good Samaritan that was kindled almost 50 years ago. The theme of the Lenten series has been on finding the intercession between the sacred and the secular. Justin asked me to share with you tonight my faith story, what I do and why I do it, and what motivates me. Thank you for the opportunity to share my reflections on these matters, and particularly how my faith informs my work. These are questions I have discerned at pivotal points in my life. In discernment, it's sometimes not the why that matters, but it's the what. What lit the path in my journey in life that began when I was born into this world? What lit my path? Please hold that thought for a moment. I came into the world as the son of two 16-year-old parents, Margarita and Simon. We lived several blocks away from Good Samaritan with my grandparents on El Paso Street. My mother dropped out of high school when she became pregnant with me and 18 months later had my younger brother Michael. My young parents' marriage did not last. Having joined the military, my father was gone for long periods of time and they divorced four years after they were married. My grandparents were a great support to our family during this time and my mother labored and learned what it was to be a single mom. One summer morning, my brother and I joined my mom at the Missouri Pacific Railroad Depot downtown and we boarded a train to Wisconsin to join my new dad and new family at a migrant labor camp. We were beginning the long trip to Wisconsin and I thought, who is this family, who is this person, and who are these other members of this new extended family that I was going to meet. My brother and I slept in a bed with four other people and we didn't know any of them and there were 20 people in the room. 
We were too young to work, so we spent the days at a migrant school camp. And in the afternoons, we'd go and walk down the farmhouse, gravelly road, and we'd play on the pile of corn husks that were there. On Sunday afternoons, we would watch these go-karts race up and down this road, and we'd cheer for the blue one or the red one, whichever one we thought was our favorite, and we would eat raspas that afternoon. When we returned to San Antonio, that was very welcome. I thought, it's time to get back home. And we moved in with my grandparents. They helped my mom and new dad buy a small house near General McMullen. And that's where I spent the next 18, 12 to 18 years, uh, living and working and playing around the Good Sam area. I knew poverty growing up, but I was not defined by it today or then. My brother and I share a small room every night ended with prayer. I would kneel beside my bed, I'd say my prayers, I'd lie down, and I would think. That was something that I did every single night, and I often thought about death. Uh, why do people die? If God is our salvation, why do good people die? And these thoughts, you know, were sometimes talked about at Sunday sermon, but I wanted more. I wanted to know what lit my path. Please hold that thought for a moment. I was a good student. At, at an early age, the school library became my best friend. I spent countless hours there. My grandfather was an air, airplane mechanic at Kelly Air Force Base, and he was my first mentor. He graduated from Lear High School in the 30s, and he taught me the value of hard work and honesty. By the time I graduated from John F. Kennedy High School a dozen years later, I'd already worked eight different jobs. I sold fruit door to door. I cut lawns. I worked with my grandfather fixing cars. I worked at an engineering firm drawing airplane parts. I worked in grocery stores. I had a lot of experience by the time I finished high school. And my last three years of high school, I worked almost full time. I decided many years ago, uh, when I was in high school, like a junior, I said, you know what, I want to go to college. No one in my family had ever gone and I said, this is a path for myself. It's something I wanted to do. And I started to get letters in the mail from colleges who said, apply to our school. We'd like you to consider us. And I did. I wanted to apply to about seven different schools. I forged my parents' signatures and applications. And I submitted everything to my counselor. And in April of that year, I waited for the letters to come in. And I said, well, well, I have choices. And day after day, I opened that mailbox. And day after day, I found a few thin letters. There was good news and there was bad news, but the good news vastly outweighed the bad because I had several colleges who said, we want you to come and we'll pay for your education. And I told my mom, and she was very happy and very accepting, and she gave me her blessing to leave. My stepdad did not give me his blessing. He said to me, ¿Y con qué dinero vas a pagar? Yo no te lo doy. With what money? I'm not going to pay for it. Puedes ir a SAC. Go to SAC. We need you to keep working. My stepdad did not speak to me for three months. Mm -hmm. We eventually did speak one week before I was to leave, and with his blessing, I left to begin my studies at Columbia University. What led my path at this moment in life? Eight years later, I completed my studies, earning my BA, my law degree, and my master's in public policy from the university. For the next 15 years, I had a wonderful career in New York City. My first job out of law school, I worked for the Board of Education for the best mentor and boss that I ever had, Ed Sermier. Ed taught me a lot, the most that I know, about how to run a large organization with humanity and humility. I then worked in corporate law for six years and then served for five years as a deputy commissioner and counsel for the Department of Finance for the city. I had a law office of 40 attorneys who worked for me. I was part of a team that negotiated a number of matters that helped the city avert financial crisis. I taught as an adjunct professor for several years at Columbia and helped students understand the value of how to serve in a not-for-profit world. This was a long, long way from my early beginnings on the west side of San Antonio. And along the way, I benefited from those in my life who were willing to help me without expecting something in return. I'd like to share with you one example that had tremendous impact on my family's life. My oldest daughter, Simone, was diagnosed with autism at a young age. We were fortunate to be able to receive top-notch services when she was between the ages of one and three. Then she had to transition to the public school setting 
or a private school setting if they were willing to pay for it. My wife and I, especially she, took off time from work to go visit various schools to see what might be able to serve our daughter's needs best. And of all those places that she visited, none fit the right uh, pattern in terms of what she needed to have. We were dejected. She was disappointed. And we thought, we're never going to find a place for Simone. And then we heard about a wonderful school in Brooklyn called the League School. And it was known for being on the cutting edge of autism in education. We visited, and it was exactly what Simone needed. Caring and loving staff, appropriate academic activities. The only way she could attend, however, was if the district found that it was the most appropriate setting for her. We submitted the paper for consideration and were rejected. The league school was very expensive. We appealed and asked to present our case to the tribunal, and we held out little hope at that time. On the day of our hearing, we were sitting out in the lobby of the school building, waiting for our name to be called for the next hearing. And a gentleman walked by, Mr. Piccolo. I knew him from my time working at the Board of Education. Mr. Piccolo was the assistant superintendent for special education in that district. And we had worked together for a number of years. I had worked with him and 12 other superintendents to bring up and um, uh, renovate the centers for special education in each one of the 13 districts in the city. And been a tremendous and hugely, immensely expensive project. And I'd done a good job, I know, because I brought him up on time and everybody else. And he said, Simone, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I've got this hearing, you know, and I explained my situation. And he said, okay. He says, don't worry about it. You know, have a seat. And our name was called, and we came in, and we argued, gave our argument before the tribunal, because I had done my research. I, I had worked in special education law now for five years before I left. And so I knew the law said, you know, this has to be the right decision. I know it has to be right. And the hearing ended, and they said, your request is granted. And I was overjoyed, and so was my wife, because, you know, what, how fortuitous could it be that I see this man, Neil Piccolo, that I hadn't seen in six years. He had nothing to gain by uh, intervening other than make sure the case is heard. Are we doing the right thing? Don't worry about the cost. We should do what's right for the student. And that's what he did. What lit my path at this moment in life? My last job in New York was working for the city council. My wife and I had great jobs, but something was missing. We missed our family, but we had grown to love the city. And by this time, I had spent 23 years in New York. My wife and I prayed on it and made the decision to come home. Because our main concern was that our children were growing up without knowing their family. And family is important. And we wanted that for them and more. So we moved back to San Antonio. And many years later, my journey along the path to Good Sam was rekindled by Neil Lane. Neil is a member of St. Mark's Church. And when I came back to town, we had reconnected, or we had connected because Neil was an alumni of Columbia. So we got to know each other very early on. and. You know, he is also a former bear, uh, chair of Good Samaritan. And so he began to talk to me about Good Sam. He said, hey, you should come visit Good Sam. Come see all the good work we're doing. And I began to volunteer and support the Modelo program, which is a program that he had started there to work with getting kids of Good Sam into college. And then I began to learn about the other good work that was being done by Good Sam. And one of the things that Jason is going to ask you about later is, who do you surround yourself and why? Well, I mentioned two people now, Ed Sermier and now Neil, that I surround myself. And Ed and Neil have both been important to me, both in the progression of my faith and my professional life. Both are brilliant, the best at what they do in their careers. And both have done something for me that I've tried to emulate. Ed and I spent many hours together with him teaching, explaining, and coaching me on what it took to manage an organization with a $500 million budget with 22,000 employees serving 120,000 children. His strong faith in God didn't just guide him, it was how he lived his life. And Neil has become a great friend and mentor to me. Whenever we gather, our talk is always centered on service. What can we do together with Good Sam to serve the families of our community? He's always been keenly focused on the power of education and how it could be transformational in one's life. Many years later, he asked me if I would consider serving on the Good Sam board. And after the fourth time, I said yes. Um, 
there could be no better leaders and men of God than Ed and Neil. What lights my path in my journey through life? It's one word, and that's love. In the book, No Greater Love by Edward Tree, the author speaks about what Jesus taught about love and forgiveness during the Passion. One thing that has stayed with me is Mr. Tree's explanation of like versus love. Like means to feel attraction toward, take pleasure in, or enjoy. It is based on feelings. Love goes beyond our emotions and resides in the will. Love is a decision, a choice, to will the good of the other, to seek what's best from the other person, for the other person. We may not be able to like a certain person or his or her actions, but we are called to love everyone. I know not only love, but I like my wife, my children, my mom, dad, brothers, friends, and the people I serve and work with at Good Sam. I strive to love the people I barely know or that throughout my life have been cruel and hurtful to me both physically and emotionally. I love my stepdad who first said no. I love the dad I barely knew growing up. Love is just a word, but without action, that's all it is. It's just a word. I'd like to read from chapter 58 of the book of Isaiah to help me describe what has lit my path and why I do what I do. In this Old Testament reading, Isaiah is speaking about how it is not enough to just observe the laws and be pious. We are called to be actively involved in God's work. Why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Look, you serve your own interest on your fast day and oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. And such is such the fast that I choose, a day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose, to loosen the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, or to break every yoke? It is, not to share your bread. is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin, that then your light shall break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help and he will say, I am here. Isaiah is imploring us to fast from injustice, oppression, and restrictive social ways. He asks us to treat one another as neighbors, because when we do this, that is love. These words aren't just words anymore, because when we serve our neighbor, feed him, clothe her, pray for them, support the education of our neighbor's children, hire them in our place of business, we are professing love for our neighbor. From the, good, from the parable of the Good Samaritan. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Several months ago, about 10 a.m. on a Monday morning, a regular visitor to Good Sam asked to see me. Respecting his privacy, I'll refer to him as one. He has been a fixture at Good Sam for decades. He was an artist. He was the person whose works of art adorned the entrance doors at Good Sam and hundreds of other businesses throughout the city ushering in the start of school with colorful oversized crayons and books and the start of the holidays with wreaths and ribbons. We first met about two months after I arrived at Good Sam. We walked and talked many times over the next three years. He had a large extended family and had grown up around Good Sam and his children attended the Good Sam programs. He and his wife divorced many years before and he had struggled with various demons throughout his life but I could see that he loved this family and he loved life. Whenever Juan came to see me, we'd sit and talk or we'd walk and talk and I'd ask him how he came up with his designs, why he pursued his careers, what else he had done in his life. He always greeted me and I always greeted him the same way. He called me Mr. Simon and I called him Mr. S, his last name. I saw in him, admired in him, the things I hoped others saw in me, hardworking, honest, creative, caring. 
It was my friend, my neighbor. This particular Monday, Juan came in using a walker and was wearing a backpack. That's where he carried his paints and brushes. His health had been deteriorating. He had surgery in the past year and was still recovering, but he continued to work. We sat down to talk. Mr. Simon, I hate to ask you, but can I ask you for a favor? I need $20 to buy some paint and take the bus back home. Some kids stole my paint and I need to buy more. I'll pay you back as soon as I can. I got my wallet and I had $16. I said, Juan, this is all I have. Will this do? And he said, yes, thank you. I'll pay you back soon. And he walked out, and from my window, I saw him with his walker going over to the bus stop in front of Good Sam. Two days later, I walked into my office, and two of my staff asked to speak to me in the conference room. We have some bad news. Simon, Mr. S is dead. Juan had taken his life the night before in the park next to Good Sam. My friend was gone. And I did not know why. I felt an overwhelming sadness. What would this mean to his family? Have I done enough? There were so many, there are so many people in the neighborhood, like Juan. They bring joy to others while battling their own demons. They get up every day and keep trying until they can't. We need more people like Juan in the world. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. That is what we do at Good Samaritan. This is what we do in your name and in the name of Jesus Christ, and that is what has lit the path in my life. My life of service is furtherance of my faith. My faith and my service are not two parts. They are one. That is why I do what I do. Blessings to all of you. Amen. Thank you, Simone, for your words uh, this day and for um, sharing your heart with us. Um, what lights your path? What a, what a great question that is. And, and I hope you respond like Simone responds, and that is with love. The opposite of love is fear. And I think a lot of people are living in fear right now. Um, many people live in fear all the time. Um, uh, but when we're in a crisis like this, we oftentimes are um, drawn to fear. And I would say the best question that we could probably ask ourselves right now is what lights our path? And is that love, the love of Jesus Christ, that can transform us and renew us? And so I'd invite you to ponder that question, what lights your path? And then also to think about the other questions that we wanted you to uh, ponder this day. Who do you surround yourself with and why? And, and really, we are trying to get at, you know, who, who are your circle of friends and, and why are they so important to you? And, um, and how are you, especially now in this time, reaching out to them and caring for them? And how are they reaching out to you and caring for you? And is there the possibility that you could um, widen and broaden that circle of friends? that it would include people who um, um, are struggling um, even more so than you are in this time of need. Um, and then the other question that we had for you this evening is when have you fought for someone else's well-being, for a cause, or stood up for someone else? Um, and I, I believe we, we, we asked that question of you because um, Simone is a living testimony um, and a walking example of what it is to stand up for someone else. To, to actually reach out to other people. Um, and the work of Good Samaritan Center is just that, to stand up and give voice to those who have no voice, to love those who live in fear, and to care for those who have no one to care for them. And so when have you done that for someone in your life? And how could you continue to do that, not only today, but in the future? And so, Simone, thank you again for your example for who you are and what you represent and how you affect change in our community um, and for the good work that Good Samaritan Center does. 
and I hope and pray for all of you who are watching this video at this time that you would ponder these questions and be moved to a new way of, of working and living and reaching out to those in need. Thank you for tuning in.